In his annual report published this week, the Director General of the GAA, Tom Ryan, defended a proposal from late last year to cut five counties from the Hurling League. Fielding the teams is simply papering over the cracks, he said. Tonight we're going to try to assess what the biggest cracks are and how they might be addressed. It's a dilemma as old as the GAA itself. How to grow hurling, how to develop the weaker counties and spread the reach of the game. The recent proposal to confine five counties to championship hurling only and give them time to reset and rebuild their hurling structures caused a huge backlash. So the proposal was deferred, but yet the problem remains. One could argue that the hurling map looks more or less the same as it always has. In 1994, Nicky Brennan declared that the game was dying on its feet. Numerous initiatives followed, among them was Shkame Imona 2000, the brainchild of then-president Joe McDonough. £2.5 million was set aside for the three-year project, the biggest ever investment in the game. Next up, Sean Kelly's Hurling Development Committee saw the Christy Ring, Nicky Rackard and Laurie Maher Cups established. A national hurling director was appointed, first Paddy Butler and later Martin Fogarty. But since Fogarty stepped down in late 2021, the position has remained vacant. Competitions such as the Thorn Leagues and the Celtic Challenge have worked well but are unheralded by the general public. On the ground though, coaches say that Gaelic football development squads or club sessions often coincide with the hurling games and there's only one winner. What of the counties that are further on in their journey towards making or sustaining a place in the Lee McCarthy Cup? Sports science supports and funding was in the past given to those counties but are we any closer to stopping the seesaw nature of top flight promotion and then relegation? Plans have come and gone but programs has been slight. In the past few years, there have been worrying signs of the game struggling in some traditional counties. The last couple of seasons have seen the Allianz League lack jeopardy, although that has now been tweaked. Some feel that the hurling championship feels a little squeezed, and there has been a cry to see more hurling games on TV. The suggestion to move the five counties from the league could be revisited down the road if progress is not seen. And progress is possible. Just ask Toreen Nace, Trilly CBS, and Carlo. The GAA's new strategic plan, Aintus, is now in operation, but when Jarlath Burns takes office and oversees this new plan, structure, strategy, accountability and measurability will surely have to be the key points. The Louth Hurling Captain Peter Fortune, the Westmeath Hurling Manager Joe Fortune are with Liam and Ursula to try to weigh through what seems like a rather very wide, varied issue or issues. The reason we have you two in is because we've decided to try to focus a lot of it on perhaps the counties, the five counties who are nearly gone from the league and also obviously the teams who are maybe seesawing between Liam McCarthy and Joe McDonough level and how we can get so many, many more up to that level. Before we get to the two lads, Liam, maybe you can give us your view of what you see as the hurling landscape at the moment. Yeah, Joanne, I guess, you know, we could probably do it a month to talk about this now, so to, to squeeze it into the next few minutes is difficult, but I suppose on, on the culture where people are so passionate about the GA and hurling especially, uh, you know, I suppose what it's given to me over my lifetime and what it's given to my, my parish in Portrow, like, it is incredible. Um, and, you know, I, I, I suppose organisations all over the world are all the time working with the research and design to try and find the breakthrough product. We have it. It's hurling. <clears throat> and I suppose I'm looking at it, I'm saying, we have the longevity of 140 years, but we haven't really grown it. And I think we're at the stage where we've really got to seriously look at how we can broaden where we play hurling and how often it's played. Um, we do some things really well in the GA, in my view. I think the facilities that we have are incredible. I know it was a Red rant last night, but outside of Cork, <laughs> uh, all of the clubs, if you go into any club, the facilities that they have, and why is that there? Why are they there? It's because of the volunteers. All of the volunteers we have in every club and the work that they do, the time that they give, the energy that they give to their clubs is just incredible. And we need to make sure we look after those volunteers. But I just feel there's a disconnect between what's spoken about at national level and what's happening at clubs on the ground. One of the things that's on that strategic plan that we spoke about earlier is the games to training ratio. Take my own county in Tipperary. So you have teams back training now in January and February. The first round of the championship uh, for the senior and premier intermediate will start at the end of July. There's 32 teams within four weeks and potentially some people, some teams have gone in two weeks. Within four weeks, 16 teams are out of the championship after four weeks. So we can talk about the games to training ratio. We have clubs training for seven months, the expenditure that goes to training for seven months, and within two to four weeks, you're out of the championship. You know? And then we look at the meaningful games and participation. If you're an under 13 in Portro, you're away with it, right? You'll play 20 games. You'll be awash with games. You roll that on. You know, you get to a senior team, you get two games or three games in a month, and if you don't win them, you're gone. You get to our under-21 team, you have um, one game. Five of our players in our club had one game this year. Just one game. 
and our juniors were gone in mid-June before our seniors played in July. So there were six weeks where the juniors had gone out of the field and where some nights you might have 14 or 15 training in the field. So these are all the real issues. So people ask me, is the split season working? How can a split season where clubs are getting two and four weeks uh, that, that to me, and someone said, oh, well, we're almost there on the, uh, on the, on the split Tom season. Tom Ryan said that. I, I, I absolutely don't agree with that. I think it's, I, I agree with the concept of the split season because players are looking for certainty, but we don't have the optimum model. And one final point I want to make, Joanne, all we're doing is we're creating super clubs. Some of the bigger clubs are getting bigger. We don't need an association where it's all about domination as opposed to competition. Slough Neil, 11 in a row. Uh, Ballygunner, 10 in a row. Nace, 5 in a row. St. Thomas is seven out of the last nine. If we don't have competition, we want to attract people. So, you know, our mission is to really be volunteer-led, be, be the heartbeat of our communities, but I think we need to take a look at where we're at because in the stronger counties and in the counties across from me, I think we're not anywhere where we should be or we, where we could be. OK, so they're struggling like that in a traditional club like Port Row, in a traditional county like Tipperary. Can't imagine what it's like where the two of you are. Peter, first of all, take us through what's happened since. So it was early last November. There was this plan that was just put forward as a, a proposal. It didn't go through yet. It's been deferred. So what's happened? You're obviously captain of Louth, one of the five counties. What's happened since then? Yeah, well, I suppose um, as a player, you're straight into National League. You know, we didn't have time to reflect. It was very much so... Right, training is starting now. We have games to prepare for. We have to get ready. Um, I suppose, as a county ourselves, we've ratified a hurling development committee, which is a plus. Um, but really, like, I'd like to look at that proposal stage and look at it as an opportunity. Now, the fact that I'm sitting here this evening and loud hurling is being discussed is a major step forward, but it's only a first step. And it has to do a lot more. And we need help. Um, you know, you're talking about your club and your area. I'm a St Mullins man from Carlo, where I was sent to train at four years old. There was a helmet put on my head. I was put in the back of my neighbour's car and I never looked back. And mm. that, that's my hurling journey. That journey is not there for children in all of these counties. And that is an issue. But as Liam said, the game itself will sell. We have to get the children to see the game. And at the minute, they just don't see the game. They see snippets of it here and there. And yes, they can watch something like tonight and they can see Limerick, Kilkenny and Tipperary and I watch it and I love it and I love the growing up. But they need to see their local heroes. They need to see uh, Luca McCusker from Fermanagh. They need to see how talented he is and say, I can be him. I can play for Fermanagh. They need to see a Conor Murphy from Loud and say, I can be Conor Murphy. You know, I can make that step up to be on my inter-county panel and want that. You know, I, we, we all grew up I grew up in my back garden. I won 100 All-Irelands in my back garden. <laughs> like I don't have one yet, but, um, you know, that's, what, that's the dream I want to sell tonight is to, to the GA that, you know, there's a generation of hurlers here now who have had this frustration. You know, we felt it. I'm only with Loud five years and I've felt it. There are lads who have come from underage through this structure and, you know, it's amazing that they are where they are and they still have that passion and drive. There's a generation of hurlers here who are crying out and just asking, we don't want the next generation to feel like we feel. We don't want the next generation to bang their heads off the wall for 10 years and feel like they're in the same position. We want, and we're saying to them, we will do some of the work, but volunteers, as you said, can only get us so far. You know, there's volunteers in our counties that are keeping the game alive. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's a number of, of men and women that are keeping the game alive in, this, in these counties. And without Central coming down to ground level, getting in there with a proper task force, not one man or one woman going around and sh showing a session that can be done, but actually saying, here's a plan, and it could take 15 years. And even if in five years it's not working, Let's come back in five years and review it. Let's not put this on the back burner. You know, there's an opportunity here. Let's strike when the iron is hot now. You know, let's think outside the box. What's happening right now is not working. You know, we, we discussed many ideas before, like a festival of a hurling for the ring, the record and the Mar finals and getting children into Croke Park. You know, ideas like that. We need to go outside the box here and we really need to because People might not realise it, but hurling is clinging on in these counties. Mm. And it is the same people who have kept it alive for those couple of years are keeping it alive today. OK, we will go through the various ways you can do exactly what you're talking about to get the dream and to have 
the possibility of the future loud and for mine, like having Longford, Leitrim, hurlers, having that dream alive. Before we get to that, Joe, so you're at a slightly different level. So we saw your Westmead performing so well today, but ultimately being beaten by, by the All-Ireland champions. You've gone up and down quite a bit. You've had some great days. You've had some not so great days. What do you see as the biggest issues? And I should let people know as well, of course, you have managed Ballybone St Enda's within Dublin. You've managed underage county teams with Dublin as well. So, so you've seen both sides of it. I think... Going back to even what Liam said, I think if you're going to do something at any level, in any capacity, whether you're from Loud, from Anna, Wexford, Westmead, whatever, you have to do things right. And I think for this to work or for us to improve as Westmead or as Dublin or as Wexford or whatever it might be, there has to be a sense of humility here on the basis that we have to first of all realise that there is a problem. Mm. And the problem is, based on what Liam said like over the course of the show this evening, at his age, when he was younger, he would have walked to training in his bare feet to get there. And there's a question about why are some players stepping away? And the reason that some people are stepping away is because that sense of humility at the top level is not there. There's not a realisation that there is a problem. And the big thing for me is there's a massive difference between managing an organisation and leading it. And we need leaders to stand up and realise at this level, for where Westmead are at the moment, yes, they've been up and down since I arrived in 22. They got from, you know, Division 2, a hard-fought Division 2 to get to Division 1, and you get to Lee McCarthy, and you get successful days, and it means an awful lot to the people of Westmead. But then where is the backup after that? Where is the real people on the ground? We don't need, going back to what Peter said, you don't need a hurling evangelist going around spreading the gospel with, 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 with sessions here and there. We need continuity. We need people on the ground. We need real people on the ground. But people on the ground... I often wondered if you brought somebody in from a different country with no knowledge of our game whatsoever, how hard it would be, would be to explain, first of all, provincially how we're set up, and second of all, when it comes to really the access to proper facilities, how it's so different from the top seven or eight down to where I am, down to where Peter is. And don't tell me, like, listen to the passion in that man's voice, mm. and he said it to me behind, like, he nearly apologised for, 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 for being from Loud or for being from Carlow and playing for... Like, there's a sense here of pride. Like, rugby has this scenario, this is us. Have we lost a sense of who are we? I think we've lost a sense of it's about inclusivity, it's about management, but it's about leadership too. When you say we've lost it, who are you talking about, really? As an association, I think we've, we're concentrating too much on certain areas being better than others. And I think for Westmead to draw with Wexford in 2022, to beat Wexford in 2023 was huge. As a Wexford man, it hurts me to say that maybe at times, but as a Westmead manager, how proud you could be of a group of players. We travel 60 miles on a Thursday night to train. The Westmead players come to Abbottstown on a Thursday night to train because we don't have facilities. Like Frank Meskel announced last week, two weeks ago, that there is going to be a centre of excellence in Westmead. But it's been a long time coming and it's only for the vision of the likes of Frank and Patrick Doherty and those people that this is now happening. But, but you're presumably paying big money to go to Abbottstown, are you? Yeah, but, and again, encourage, like, you look at what the GPA are trying to really back the players and, and encourage the players to travel in, in, in cars together to, to have that green mile, you know. And these are players who could be coming from different parts of Westmead. Like, we have a, we have a guy in, you know, in Athlone who could, probably tra who could probably travel 40 minutes to get to Mullingar and then has to go to Dublin. And, and then you, you look at the reason about when Joe Fortune goes back in September or October and he's ratified Liam, how does he encourage and really drive the energy behind a group of players who realise that this is, this is ahead of them. Like, that journey on a Thursday night is ahead of them. Now, you can give them the token gesture of saying, look, you'll have a great day like Wexford last year, but mm -hmm. is it enough? Do, do we not need now to look at leading from the top? And leading from the top with the humility, first of all, to realise there is a big difference, there's a big gap. But look at the results this weekend. Antrim, a point to Dublin. Like, we were, what, five or six points off? Mm -hmm. Like, that was a huge day in Westmead today. It was a massive day. And then you look at, over the last couple of years, Ask Eddie Brennan what it meant to the people of Leash that time when they went down there. Ask Cork what it was like going up to Antrim when they came in out of, out of a Joe McDonough as well. Look at the turnover that we've had when we really get an opportunity and a chance. But there has to be a sense of longevity to this. You have to give us an opportunity and a chance to stay there for a couple of years to really develop these younger players as well. I should point out at this stage, by the way, that we did ask for a representative of the G8 to come on and be, this, be on this discussion so that they could give their views. Uh, obviously, Jarlath Burns is not in Azuchtron yet and Larry McCarthy is towards the end of his tenure, so it wasn't possible for that. We did ask for the Earth Store, Tom Ryan, to come in. He wasn't put forward to come in on this. So they did issue a statement saying that their national action uh, development plan is being discussed and that it'll be presented to the next Uchtron uh, shortly and then the findings will be made public. Ursula, obviously Wexford, despite all you've talked about earlier on about Keith Rossiter and he's come in and what he has to work with, 
is there that fear within that county? We saw what ha happened awfully and they're trying to fight their way back. There are some counties, aren't there? They are just hanging on in there. Well, yeah, last year would have been extremely disappointing. We were within a point of going down to Joe McDonough level and that would have been disaster for Wexford. And I suppose for me, from my perspective, I think the club scene the last three, four years in Wexford wasn't working. It was the split season model where you were playing hurling for six, seven weeks um, and that was it. Club players, you know, again, I think the club players are central to this because they were being forgotten about then uh, for the rest of the year. As Liam said, they were putting in huge shifts of training over three, four, five, six months, trying to keep that motivation going. But in Wexford for the past three, four years, the hurling took place first for six or seven weeks. It was just like, get the games out of the way, play it. Players were getting injured. Managers were unable to adapt any kind of style of play. And then it was like football played. And then when it came to Leinster Hurling Championship, our teams had a 10 or 11 week break. And that was having a knock on effect because they weren't able to build any momentum. So to me, that was having a detrimental effect on Wexford Hurling because I felt, you know, how can you build then a county team if the club scene is struggling? But they have, they have adjusted They have that. rectified it and have changed it where it's alternate blocks two to three weeks. And I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing that happening this year. We are already, there's so much to talk about, already the time is beginning to tick. So let's talk about what can. You, you've made such an impassioned plea there about what you think can happen. So what specifically needs to come in, in your opinion, Peter, in order to connect all the dots? And most crucially, who needs to be responsible and how can there be accountability for if it doesn't happen? Yeah, well, look, I suppose our biggest issue when the whole proposal came out was at the minute we don't have a strategic plan for developing hurling in these counties. There isn't one. You know, there's nobody coming to us when that proposal is there saying, you know, if this is passed, this is A, B, C, D. This is where we go. This is how we get you back into the league. You know, it, it was going to be just left in the air. And, like, we feel that a strategic plan has to be put in place for these types of counties. And then the time and the funding has to be given to it. You know, it has to be backed financially. But again, it has to be backed with a commitment, as Joe said, that we will, you know, keep this going. No matter whether it fails, it's not going to fly in every county. If it, if it, if it did, we'd all have hurling, you know, flying in every county so if it was simple. So not just coming from the Louth County Board or the Longford County Board, but coming from the, to from the top, from the is that it? the top, yeah. with, with consequences, who puts these plans in place? Where does it have to come from? Well, uh, we believe a task force needs to be put together, you know, of the right people who have the ideas. Again, look, I'm very conscious I'm sitting here and I'm speaking and my voice does not cover hurling in all these counties. And, you know, again a lot of times you reflect on your own and what's happening on your front door. But at the minute, we have club scenes in all these counties. You're talking about the Wexford club scene and how you can see that drop off. We have club scenes here, you know, that are really struggling. Like, again, we have three clubs in Loud at the minute competing for a senior championship. Maybe we have to think completely outside the box and break down boundaries and start to look at, you know, we're going to play league hurling in Mead next year. And that's going to be a massive opportunity for St. Feckins to, you know, develop our young players. As you said, at the minute, our players aren't getting enough chances to actually play. You know, some players can be, you know, halfway through their playing career. And we all know, we've all had a time where we didn't get into the team or, you know, it's just not working out for you at that time. And they're just not getting the games. And this is happening at juvenile level as well. So we really have to look at getting these people just playing hurling. Again, as Liam said at the very start, Playing hurling will hook these people. I fully believe that. Again, okay, I go back to the very time I started playing hurling. I only had to do it once, and I knew I wanted to do it for the rest of my life, or as long as I could. Joe? Yeah, I have, I have a couple of things. I, I, th I think the big thing for me is, like, you'll have people in Ireland tonight that will sit at home and they'll stay up to watch the Super Bowl, whatever employers might think of that tomorrow. We have a game that, we're so, that we love, that's part of our DNA. I listened at the weekend there to, to Fermanagh manager, Joe Baldwin, who mm. spoke about how... Three weeks after having a stroke, he talked about losing his son, Connell, in 2012. And the only thing that got him through that lean, Ursula, was the fact that he'd hurling. hurling. He was, it was our integrity, right? And it was in part, it was part of us to be that type of people. And why can't we put on that festival of hurling? Like, we sit around, Ursula said earlier on, till four o'clock, you know, waiting for a hurling final, for a senior hurling final. Why can't we have a hurling weekend that's a festival of all that we're good about? That's the first thing. The second thing is, a huge thing for me is, when we talk about promotion of the game, like, in 2022, when we drew at Wexford, you'd put a better camera possibly into the beach in Port Marnock to watch the kids playing in the sea. 
this has to improve. You look at the camera angle yesterday, like, you know, Ronan Sheehan, one of the most passionate GA men you have in the North. Look at the camera that was sent yesterday or the camera work that was there. And it's not me, it's me saying, even today's match against Limerick, like, Ronan won't learn too much about us or any other team because I wouldn't say some of the mothers would have recognised some of the faces in, in, in the, today. And that needs to improve. We need to promote it. The young lads that are in Westmead that are going to school tomorrow morning, that are in Peter's class tomorrow, need to see Peter on the television. They need to see him. That's our teacher. They need to be proud of what they're part of. And for me, that identity is a small bit lost. Why was there not a proper camera sent to Cusick Park? Probably because there was an expectation that Limerick were going to win by 25 or 30 points, similar to last weekend. But surely we deserve more than that. And surely the game at the level where Peter's playing as well deserves it. Maybe we need another Monday session where we can acknowledge the work that these lads, because I know the likes of, you talk to Dara Egerton or Tommy Doyle, they're putting in the same effort than what Ronan Maher and these lads are too. It, it's just something that's part of our DNA, but surely we can promote it better. I know you have so many ideas about what we can do. The, the time has just its absolutely <laughs> flown. I'm really sorry. We will get you back on to talk about that. We'll get you on perhaps some of our radio shows as well. But we have run out of time. Huge thank you to Joe and to Peter in particular for coming on tonight. And hopefully we'll chat more and keep this conversation going. And as always, a thank you to Liam and to Ursula.